sorry. <laughs> sorry guys, my bad. <laughs> um, I'm starting up all the torches now. Goku, where are you? Goku's right here with me. But yeah, as you can see now, I have a preference of my wardrobe. Black is the preference and uh, you cannot spot Goku very well here. But believe me, believe me, he's here. You can see the little bump over there on my neck. Yeah, here's my pal. So let me set up everything. Uh-huh. Good, I think. Yeah, I think we're good to go. How are you guys? Let's see who do we have here. We have Moraid as always. Always loyal to the appointment. Then we have Claire, we have Kuntfische, Viridis, Alejandro, Aharon, Kiwis here, Absurdum is here. Don't know which one of the three, but Oh God, I have my first description. Okay guys, like I, I have a lot to tell you. I, there's lots and lots to fill you in with. But first, first things first, let me do something that I believe is what we're all waiting for. I, I, yeah, just. Happy 4th of May. And stop because copyright. <laughs> May the 4th and the 4th and everything be with you guys. And yes, of course, uh, for this special day, I have with me my Stormtrooper mug. Uh, I actually have like a lot of super cool Star Wars t-shirts, but I don't have them here with me. So one day, I promise I will show them to you. So, right, there's a lot, a lot to fill you in with. Uh, first thing is first, there was the music. Second thing is second. My tea today is a tricky one because again, I received for Christmas a package of tea that was a present and um, it didn't say what some teas were. And in the case of this one, for example, it said herbal tea. In like multiple languages, I am pretty sure it was at least 11, 12 languages and in all of them it said herbal tea. And um, I don't know which herbs are in this one. I can smell and I could see lemongrass, but I am not amazing identifying leaves and plants. That's what my friend Aina is for. So I actually have no idea, but yeah, cheers to you guys. It's a very lemony like tea. So do you know if it's a hint of star and ice? I have no idea. Right, I just saw that Moraid subscribed to me and this is because this channel has met the requirement for me being an affiliate now. Yes! So that means uh, you can guys support what I do with your subscriptions. If you follow all the people on Twitch, you already know more or less what subscriptions are about. I invite you to consider subscribing to me with your support. You help me grow, you help me sustain this Twitch channel and to create and to improve what I do, my content, the materials I have, the time I do have. So what a very cool thing is that if you have an Amazon Prime account, this account comes with a free Twitch uh, subscription. So you can link your Amazon Prime to this channel if you wish to support it. And you don't have to pay because it's included in your package of the Amazon Prime. So just please consider for a second. I would really like to give a strong hug from here to Moraith, my first subscriber. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You helped me a lot. And uh, yeah, that is, that is a huge novelty. I am very happy. Like I am on cloud nine with this. This is a very big surprise because I have not been streaming for that long. But yet you guys are here with me, accompanying me, and because of your loyalty and because of the commitment we both have, now I am eligible for a Twitch affiliate thing. But it's just, I am very happy. I am very happy to announce it. And um, yeah, <laughs> I just didn't know what else to say. I am, I'm just, I'm just very happy. Um, so, um, are your hoops just playing hoops? The Kiwi asked. Yes, my hoops are just playing golden hoops. But actually, 
my t-shirt is a gift from a very dear person. It's a Hollow Knight t-shirt. Which, which of you know Hollow Knight? Because it's fairly one of the best games I've ever played. As in, in my life. I really like Hollow Knight and someone very dear to me. Do you remember Bob? I've mentioned Bob quite a few times in this channel. So Bob gave me this as a birthday present. And um, yeah, I just love this t-shirt. This was the closest, the closest thing I had to a Star Wars t-shirt. We couldn't imagine, um, we couldn't imagine this being Darth Vader. I'm pretty sure the protagonist of Hollow Knight, if anything, if it wasn't the, if it was allocated in the Star Wars universe, would be a Sith. And let me tell you, Sith to the power, long live the Empire. Long live the Empire. Yeah, because you apparently enjoy my, my demon voices. Where's Alejandro? Alejandro said that he enjoys my demon voices. So. Whew, that is a lot of emotions for today. Oh yeah, <laughs> there is Alejandro. <laughs> um, whew, so what else, what else? Of course, of course, I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank my patrons. Uh, special shout out to Angel, Aina and Lucas, which are there supporting what I do from behind. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, if you want to, maybe you don't want to, um, subscribe to this Twitch channel was a little bit too much for you. I invite you to go through my Patreon. I have three tiers that you can help me with. So yeah, just take a look over there. So any new arrivals? Someone? Oh, it says there's more of you here. Who's here? Oh, I also know that a lot of my friends watch me, but they don't have a Twitch account because uh, yeah, I know there's like a lot of outside watchers of yours, but they don't have a Twitch account. So. That is fine also. I'm really happy to have you like all here. So, I think... Me were eating pancakes. Helena, I am so, so jealous right now. I love pancakes. What are you having them with? What do you guys want, like, what do you guys like to add to your pancakes? I'm a very big fan of classics, maple syrup and bacon. That is like the go to me. What am I talking about? I am making myself hungry and that is not good because I don't have food at hand. <laughs> But yeah, we, did, we didn't come here to talk about pancakes and certainly you didn't turn in to hear me talk about pancakes. <laughs> so, so yeah, let's dive into it. Today we'll be discussing what we believe is the first post service in history ever to be created. Um, ooh, with mango. Laura, focus, not food, not pancakes, post services. Right. <laughs> so, uh, the service we'll be talking about has a modern name, it's called, in Iran now it's called Chopor Khane, which literally means the house of couriers. But it was not named like that back in time, we will talk about that, we'll, we'll get there. But yes, I was saying, we believe is the first post service to be created. Of course, couriers and messengers existed from before. I, I think messengers exist from as early as people could pass messages onto each other. However, this was the first organized system. Rules were applied, a method was created, and it became a governmental institution. That is what we understand by post service. And I thought, for, when preparing for this live stream, I thought, now, due to the current situation, post services and mess like dispatching services are so crucial for so many people right now that we should appreciate what they do. They expose themselves going on the stream, delivering our orders from here to there. So I really wanted to talk about what is the earliest we have recorded as a systematic method to deliver do not just messages, as in word messages, but letters, packages, and uh, yeah, we'll be talking about this uh, Iranian post service. Of course, if you Google it, you would find some articles that say that Iranians invented the post service. I'm a little bit skeptical about that because there were, at the time, the, the Iranians, uh, the Achaemenid Empire, which is we, what we will be dealing with, at the time of the Achaemenid Empire, there were all the forces that sure had to communicate somehow and with our system. So I am pretty confident more people, like all the empires, all the cultures and all the, all the environments have their own 
system of communicating. However, as I was saying, this was the first governmental messaging system that was created in history. And we are talking about the royal method of communication of the Achaemenid Empire. Hi, Nukas, how are you? The first person we'll be talking about here, so the first great person we want to talk about here, do you guys know who this is? We'll give you two minutes to think about it. Exactly, Nukas. He is Cyrus the Great, the founder of the Achaemenid dynasty and founder of the Achaemenid Empire. This, to be more precise, is a reenactment of Cyrus from Sid Meier's Civilization VI, which is a strategy game that I really, really recommend you to play. It's super fun. And this one that you have here is possibly one of the best reenactments, reenactments sorry, from Cyrus we ever had. The the depiction of the of the king is just so well done and so well investigated. I'm such a big fan. I used to have a very big crush on Cyrus before this, but now this just confirms it. And yeah, I know Mikkel. I don't know if Mikkel is here, but I know Mikkel quite likes um, <laughs> this this Cyrus over over here. So yeah, and he's important because this invention of the post service was attributed to him. It was supposed to be Cyrus's creation, and after it was uh, developed by another uh, Achaemenid king, which is uh, Darius. Daraya was the first. He was supposed to be the the king that actually perfected and shaped entirely until it was perfectly neat. This messaging, this post uh, service system. So, how do we know? Do you know that I'm always a, a bit, a bit a, he's a daddy. <laughs> oh God, this is the first comment that show up on the box. Can you see it? Oh, my dyslexia. Like over here, <laughs> this was literally the first poster. <laughs> Such a big fan. So as I was saying, I'm a very big fan of consulting sources because as you know, I am an art historian and um, I rely on sources, both archaeological and textual, to investigate. Everything I'm going to tell you is based on my previous research, but of course I'm going to talk to you about what I've been reading. And the first one, as sad I am, <laughs> as sad as I am to admit it, <laughs> we, we have a notice of this post service through two Greek historians. The first one is... Oof. Herodotus. This is Herodotus. I, I really don't like... Nah, nah, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan, but I have a reason. Herodotus could be pretty inventive. I in mean, creative, let's just say. But archaeologically speaking, the accounts of the Chaporjones, of these houses of couriers uh, system, has been supported with findings and sites. So as much as Herodotus can be creative, his words contain also some truth. Sometimes a lot, but sometimes not at all. <laughs> so Herodotus wrote um, what he wrote was during the reign of Jerjes, uh, of Xerxes. I don't know actually to, how to pronounce it in, in English. We, we say Jerjes in, in Persian. Um, and Jerjes was uh, Darayavus, the, the king I just showed you, that, that was his uh, successor. And I am going to quote um, what Herodotus said about this system. I quote, Now there is nothing mortal that accomplishes a cause more swiftly than do these messengers by the Persians' skillful contrivance. It is said that as many days as there are in the whole journey, so many are the men and horses that stand along the road each horse and man at the interval of a day's journey. And these are stayed neither of snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor darkness from accomplishing their appointed course with all speed. The first rider delivers his charge to the second, the second to the third, and thence it passes on from hand to hand to hand. This riding post is called in Persia Agareion, which is something that comes from Akkadian, 
Egirtu or so scholars believe. So this is uh, from uh, Herodotus. Um, this is what what he says about that. What was that, Lucas? Where say something like Zerzes? That is so ugly. I'm going to say with the Persian pronunciation. I'm going to say Jerjes. <laughs> so. So this is the first description we have by Herodotus. And then there is another Greek historian. His name is Xenophon. Xenophon. We say Xenophon in, in, in Greek. The proper, um, in, is the proper pronunciation. So uh, these... Um, this historian had uh, a very big work. His magna opera was called the Syropaedia, like a whole encyclopedia just dedicated to the figure of Cyrus. And actually, uh, these, these author explained a little bit more how this system worked because Herodotus was more fascinated. Like, truth to be told, the Greeks were flabbergasted <laughs> before this. Like you can see in the text, they actually admire the system a lot because it was very organized, because it was something that actually worked. And uh, everybody was a little, was very committed to create a whole system that functioned properly. So I'm going to try, I'm going to attempt and tell you how these works because it's a little bit tricky. Um, so the roots First of all, were the roads. These roads were created for and wide the imperial territories to reach all corners that were deemed important. That's the first side, uh, the first step. Sorry, but these roads were just ways. As in, they don't seem to have been specially taken care of, like pavement, pavement, bleh, pavmented, pavmented or something. They no, they just, they just. A path, like a mark on the path, is the way. So, they reached from Sardis, which is a city in Turkey, to Susa, which is a city in southern Iran, and that means up to two thousand five hundred kilometers. That is a lot. That is long, and all along the way there were posts or resting stations, um, and each of them were one day a part of the other. And between these two points, this was a day of horse riding. This uh, measurement was supposed to be the maximum distance a horse could travel, like in one day, without being overridden. That's what they say. And these stations were fully equipped to take care of horses and messengers. In fact, a lot of messengers already leap there and some of them will be day riders and some of them will be night riders. So when the day rider arrives, he passes the jaded horse to a groom, dispatches the message to another courier and then the night rider takes a fresh horse and departs. This way, the service never stops. Like, think, think of it for a moment. This is possibly possibly the quickest way to react to any event that occurred, no matter how far, no matter how near. The system was supposed to be organized so neatly that news literally flew from one corner to the land, of the land to the other. Can you imagine, can you imagine the impact of something like that? We're talking about the fifth century before common era. This is huge! Like, news and orders reach their destination faster than if they had to use auditive or visual signs, which they were also used. Um, don't think just because a new system uh, was developed, they absolutely abandoned the other two. No, 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 they, they, were, they were still in use. I know because it is very cool. So just to give you a little bit of side explanation, a visual sign system to communicate will be, for example, fires lit gradually, like the beacons in Lord of the Rings. Like, such an epic scene. And then we have the auditive signs that were as simple as they seem, shouts, 
<laughs> just literally screaming something uh, to somebody that was in front, maybe because it was a river in between. So yeah, that's, that's the two uh, system. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to do a quick off topic pause to tell you that today's weather is crazy, it's ridiculously warm and it's very, I have like a system of learning so the sun doesn't like hit me in the face. I'm not a big fan of the sun nor hot weather so I am doing what I can. <laughs> so yeah, if you see changes in the light there's not much I can do. I do not control the elements unfortunately yet that is what my next movement will be about <laughs> yes it is a very impressive scene on the on on the film so i said that these posts were called agarellon but there's another word for it that is astondes astondes apparently was a word used to describe the messengers themselves that these kind of messenger, the dispatches, um, the, they, they deliver, sorry, they pass the dispatches onto one another. And Darius III, which is not the, the same one as I showed you guys before, that one was Darius I. I am talking about Darius III here. He wore, he wore that word as a title, the Astandes, so clearly it says something about the importance of these people because he, that king used that word to refer to himself when he was still a crown prince. So again, this gives us hints to understand how important and how highly consider the messengers were. But of course, we have more words and more evidence of these people. In Persepolis, Tartejamsid, which is the big capital city of the Achaemenids, which is located south of Iran, very, very close to the city of Shiraz. Um, some tablets have been found with the word Piradoziz to name both messenger and horses. I think it's so cool, that one. So, and appa so apparently, what scholars believe is that these, these words, Piradoziz, Piradosis uh, refers to the whole system of express royal mail and um, that is confirmed by other text and particular examples we won't be dealing with right now but there's people, there's uh, historical characters, historical characters we know all these letters when they address the usage of these uh, royal messengers we have, we have a lot of, of information about, about these people and um, something to know about these writers is the, their importance not only laid on their swift ability of movement, which is, remember, already a lot. I feel nowadays we take for granted a big number of things and this is one of them. Um, we were saying, oh yeah, I was saying that sometimes, I really believe that sometimes we take for granted a big number of things and these like the swiftness the velocity that we get the information at i really believe is one of them these rate like we, we cannot imagine how differently would be the world if we could not deliver messages we're so used to do so instantaneously right now so you just you, what do you get what it takes do you get your phone you text something and uh, ta-da, you're done, or you go into the news, you Google something, and you have all the information you could partially wish for at hand. But no, not now, and this was revolutionary because there was any news trouble so, so fast. And also, these writers all formed, they also formed what could be called, with a lot of quote in quote, the intelligence force for the empire, again, a lot of quotes, because after all, they were responsible from they were responsible for gathering information and to deliver messages messages through all the, all the empire and this is a very big system of collecting information from different points you as an emperor controls and i want to emphasize yeah this i want i really want to emphasize this was a governmental service 
individuals were very rarely allowed to use the post system. This was supposed to be for the emperor and for the government. So that's the reason I put some quotations when I always say it's something like the post service system. It was a post service, of course, but it was a service there was no public. It was a governmental institution and because of that it was just reserved for yep, yeah, for, for royal matters. You are so right, Pitsur. Uh, if information was lower, we wouldn't have that. But hey, ups and downs, ups and downs. There is always a dark side of everything. There's also a very just just remember we have we've been we're celebrating today May the 4th, so we need to stay with the dark side of it. I think this is where these people come from, which makes me a lot a lot sad because I am a big fan of the Sith Lords. So he bars. I really don't think they're star and ice on this tea. It just tastes it just tastes like lemon. Which I am, it's not a problem, it's totally okay. But then what would you say herbal if it's just lemon herbs? Huh. So, as we can see, just to sum up a little bit, being a royal mail courier was a pretty big deal. Like, pretty big deal. <laughs> These guys... Wow, they had to train so so hard to to achieve this level but i'm gonna tell you something the messengers would be nothing literally nothing without their ro their loyal companions and co-workers the horses i promised horses when i was um advertised in the stream I'm a very big fan of horses. I really like them. I love horses so much. So, of course, if we're talking the Royal Mail system and we're talking about the invention of post service, we need to know what kind of transport the Persians had access to. So, what kind of horses were ridden by the Medes and the Persians? Let's take a look at that. Aha! Also, if you didn't like the message, you could always... What's that, eighth historian? Also, if you didn't like the message, you could always behead the messenger. Now you only ban them. Um, if you know something of the ancient world, is that the life of a messenger is absolutely sacred. And you could not just behead that person because they were working for the government. And if there was a casualty within the corpse, the corpus of it, they're gonna know. It's not that simple. It's not that simple as killing a man without consequences. Right, let's, be like, let's just pause for a moment here. I'm sorry, Leo Horse. I will come back to you here. Um, this is something that appears to be quite common when we imagine or try to reconstruct ancient history. Though, basically, it was a hurricane of violence, beheading, slaughtering, and so and so and so. As many synonyms you can quote. It wasn't. It definitely wasn't. There were no barbarians that were that were spent the weekend killing each other just because. I'm gonna quote myself again with this. People enjoyed to be alive. They really liked it. And in this case, when we think about the ancients, I don't remember who that was. I remember there was a teacher I had in uni that said the ancients were ancient, but they were not stupid. This was a very structured and organized empire. It was not as simple as killing a royal messenger. First because of a cultural, it's just a cultural thing. The person who risks their lives for delivering a message is so well valued and these weren't no peasants, they were just no random individuals picked like cherry picked from the field like now you're gonna write and deliver this message. No, this we trained these were trained workers from the government. So no, they wouldn't be as easily killed. Definitely not. And please don't think it's as simple. Do you really believe it's that simple to kill somebody? Would you do that? If you had the opportunity, you would kill someone? Not, right? Like, would you be able to? What makes you think that in the past that would be possible? 
because it was the past and they didn't have fire weapons how are you gonna do that are you gonna are you gonna be gilgamesh just like smashing things into the head of other people nah nah this was like i'm just imagining everybody just killing the male man every time they deserve they deliver something you don't want to read or something that would be so fantastic like actually the casual things among the royal mail the scandalous of the slaughtering how were they getting paid by message was the government paying them yes they were they would receive a salary that would cover the grooming of the horse and apparently these people were very powerful that we they will get a quite juicy amount of money i don't know how much though i don't know how much and uh, um i'm not sure but apparently they, they would they will be well paid it was a decent thing and again if you have a horse or you ever mounted or you have a friend that rides you know how expensive to have a horse is so because you were working for the government the horse was not yours exactly but it was from the government too so everybody need to needed they needed to take care think of the like the, the yeah they were the the horses when all this so they that meant they didn't have to take care of them personally so yeah eighth historian i know you were just being sarcastic but you will be surprised of how many people thinks that the past especially the ancient past just consists on people constantly murdering each other like it's a non-stop cycle so your sarcasm served me very well because I really wanted to point this out. It's not that easy to kill somebody. <laughs> I just, just really don't think that the past we study is this perpetual motion of blood and, and killing and nah, it wouldn't be like that. Killing humour is easier than killing messengers? For me it is. I wouldn't be able to kill a person. I don't even think if I could, I could do that. Oh, oh yes, I wanted to show you the horse. Yes, so I I was talking about horses and um, we did a class pyramid about how killable people were by the job. I really invite you to do that and to publish it in a very well reputation um, media. Yeah, I, I think that will be very interesting. So let's go to the horses because I can't I can I can wait to to talk about these guys to you. So. There were a number of horses in the Persian Empire. It's not that they just rode one kind. But the best candidate for this job will be the Nisian horse, that now is an extinct breed. Um, this one over here is not a Nisian, this is an Ahalteke, which is a Turkish breed and is an actual, like, it's an nowadays breed. But the Ahal is the descendant, one of the descendants of, of the Nisian. So, it will serve as, uh, as a model on how the Persian horses actually would have looked like, more or less. Uh, perhaps I would say the Persian horse, the Nisian, would be a little bit shorter. Perhaps. I'm, I'm not sure about that. So, um, as I was saying, the Nisian horse is now extinct and uh, once once native to the southern region of the Zagros Mountains in Iran. And um, again, we're going to go back to my... <laughs> best friend Herodotus. <laughs> so Herodotus, uh, he explains these animals to be daintily caparisoned and this is because like its great 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 grandkid, the Achal, uh, Nisian horses had this distinctive sort of metallic sheen. Can you see on the on the skin of the horse, can you see on the floor of the horse like it looks shiny not shiny like shimmering ish more or less so uh yes exactly it is like gold a nickname for these horses for the ahalteke and for the nisian horses was golden horses however we know there was a lot of colors not just this golden golden brown there was chestnut color there was black coat there was also some spotted so there was a very big variety and um they were very strong and sturdy creatures, what made them very suitable for war and for running long distances. Uh, this long distances, sorry, and this is what we want here because this needs to be a very quick post service. And um, 
we know for certain, like uh, from sources and from archaeological evidence, we know that Nisian horses were the mount of Persian nobility. But I don't see the reason for them not to be also used for delivery messages purpose. Because during the reign of Darius I, the king I actually showed to you, they were bred noticeably. And in fact, even the Greeks and the Spartans imported these animals for their own use. And after they were brought to Europe and after those were brought to even the United States. So the Achal has a lot of cousins. They come from the Nisian horse. And uh, some scholars have uh, researched that same did the Sicians. Do you know them? These warrior steps, like um, from Central Asia towards Russia, they also took some horses and uh, one of the things some scholars believe is the Assyrians started a war against the Meds and the Persians because they wanted horses. That though has not been proven. There's a million reasons to kill a messenger and there's a million reasons to start a war. So that we don't know, but for sure horses were important. And by the way, at that time, Stirrups did not exist. They were not introduced in Iran until the 4th century after Common Era. And the Achaemenid Empire lasted from 550 until 330, both before Common Era. So, how not to kill yourself in full gallop when mounting one of this without stirrups. The key here is the knees. Not just the knees, but the whole body works together with the movement of the horse. It goes without saying that you should be a very, a very skilled rider to become one of these messengers. Like, proper training. And this is not something you will achieve without yeah, a very strict training. This is not something you will fall into by chance. No, 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 no. This was a service that was taken very, very, very seriously. Gonna make another tea pause. Typical war in Civ, war of the horse resource. Actually, oh, actually, that's true. Yeah. And it's been so long since the last time I played Civilization. Like, so long. <laughs> Like I have, I'm, I have like weird. Do you remember last week I was having these weird pop up messages in in Streamlabs? Now it's basically the same. <laughs> this is crazy. Ah, uh, I think my computer wants to tell me something, and that something is that he's dying. The time is nigh. <laughs> the end is nigh. So, um. We, I, I was saying, I, I've been insistent about the Achaemenid Empire because they were, they were the creators of these post service and the perfectors of that. But what happened after the Achaemenid Empire? Did this system just disappear? No, no it didn't because as you can imagine, it was extremely useful to rule a very vast empire. So the Sasanians, which is a dynasty that goes, so there's the Achaemenids, then there's the Parthian dynasty, and then there's the Sasanians. The Sasanians appear to have maintained the system, more or less, and after the arrival of Islam, the system was perpetuated, but actually it was called uh, Barid, which was a mixture between the Achaemenid rules and the modifications the Sasanians did, and some features from a familiar institution used by the Byzantines. In fact, in some sources we preserve between like, you know, the, the correspondence between the Sasanian and the, um, and the Byzantine Empire, we have some specifications when they, when they were, si were signing peace, the specifications of, uh, of the peace treatment would be the roads would be safe for the messengers to work. So both empires knew the importance of these people and this institution, so they wanted to, to warranty nobody would stop the riders or will interrupt the flow of communication because it was crucial. It was very it was very important for for the rule of the of the empire. And um well oh we have some like after um I believe yeah the word chapar khone it's a word that appears after quite a while, 
from the 15th, 16th century onwards. And literally, it means the courier's house, the house of couriers. And we have some examples today. There's remainings, although the examples I'm going to show you, they were the foundations of the example date back to Achaemenid period, one of them, and Sasanian period, the, the other one of them. But they were, as you can imagine, rebuilt, reused, reshaped in such a strong, <laughs> in such a strong way that not much of the original building has been preserved. And the structures you're going to see now, they uh, belong to the 18th century. I'm going to show you my bot first. This is my bot. Yes, it is. Oh, my face. So this is uh, in my bot. What they did, it's a whole reconstruction of how an ancient Chapar Khane would it look like. This is the entrance, and uh, actually on top, on top of that, do you see the, do you see the sign? There it says Chapar Khane my bot, which means the courier's house of my bot. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm going to show you the inside. There you have it. These horses <laughs> are props. These are dummies. These are mannequins. These are not real horses. And it's really fun and a little bit scary because if you go inside for visiting, they also have <laughs> workers as dummies, like puppets in there, sitting here and there, drinking tea, grooming the horses, getting prepared for uh for for work and it's uh it's very cute uh i haven't been there this one sent me but i haven't visited uh i haven't visited any of these two locations but actually they they did a very a very good um job with the reconstruction and i wanted to show you this wall because a particular reason is that you can actually see the holes were perfectly to the horse's size, so the horse could just lean on and eat and drink some water. And they're also in these uh, these kind of structures. Do you guys know? I'm gonna do a tea pause and I'm gonna ask you something. Do you guys know what a caravanserai is? No, don't worry, eighth historian. Um, so the eighth historian says, "Hi, Aina." The eighth historian says, "It is now if this post system was used." in diplomatic affairs or if it was only for internal matters. It was used indeed for diplomatic affairs, as in they were used as messengers to contact really far corners of the empire. And um, they, you have to imagine these people as in fully uniformed, taken like with, with the banner of the Achaemenid empire so it was a way of delivering royal messages. So yeah, definitely they were used for they were used for both internal and diplomatic affairs. Definitely. Okay, so a caravan serai is a structure, is a building. The its purpose is for caravans to serve as a resting point for caravans that are in the middle of a trip. So caravan serais are normally very well supplied, and there's people. There's a lot of people that work at the at the caravan serai. So you can go there and rest your horses, camels, donkeys and animals can uh, be groomed. You can pay for a room there. You can stay as many days as you want because uh, the weather is very hostile in certain areas of Iran. So a lot of Chapar Khanes, a lot of these post uh, stations, they also served as caravanserais. So they had a patio where horses will be and then attached to the structures, you would find all the stances, all the rooms for resting, for cooking, for eating and for sleeping and some storing space for the goods you were transporting. This is sort of the Airbnb of the time, <laughs> more or less. Yeah, they were, they were just posts like, yeah, resting places. So in a lot of occasions, caravanserais and chupar khanes are either attached to each other or very close to each other. For example, in my bud, there's just one, which is a chopar khane, because we need to think, this, this kind of chopar khane is a house that is for the messengers almost exclusively. However, in all the places, like the one I'm gonna show you now, is in, this one is in, in Yazd, is in, in a really tiny town called uh, Sar Yazd. These ones, there we have them. 
this is the Chaparjone, but also include a caravanserai because if you're gonna build up a resting place, you don't wanna do it twice. <laughs> so this is more or less the aspect they would look like. They're normally mud and um, they have these towers, but they, they are not meant for defense. There's a very, um, this is not a military fortress because I know it's easy, like, it's suggestive to and we imagine these places as defensing points, but they were not. Uh, those walls, those very tall walls, are built because of the wind to prevent the inside from getting completely, absolutely freeze during the, uh, the desert night and absolutely burned <laughs> during during the day. Um, I was in a in a familiar fortress, a fortress that follows the same system as this one when I was in Iran, but I didn't go to this one because I'm going to be completely honest with you, I didn't know this one existed because as many other archaeological sites in Iran, the preservation state is not great and these places are not very well taken care of, which is a pity, it's very regretful. But is what it is. What does that look as? Look like a bit the walls of Geruda city in Breath of the Wild. Yes, yes they do because again you need to protect the inside from the wind. Actually Gerudo is a desert city so it makes complete sense. I don't know if you guys have played Breath of the Wild. I should do a live stream about all the references to Iranian oriental architecture in games. What do you think about that? So, so yes, this is uh, what the Chaparjane would uh, would have looked like, would have looked like. Oh, sorry, my voice. I don't know what's uh, wrong with me. Sounds great. <laughs> so overall, this uh, this post system was such a big advance for the time. You really need to think about what I said before about the oh. Sorry guys, like something something happened on the screen. <laughs> you really need to think about the velocity, the swiftness we receive news from today, which is instantaneous, and then how crucial this delivering of information it is for us it is in our daily life. The system of the royal um, service, like the royal post service in Iran was such a big advancement and it really helped the umpire to deal with matters such as, for example, um, diplomatical matters, diplomatic affairs, commercial purposes, war sometimes, but it just gives you, I think it gives an idea of how perfectly organized some things were in the past. They just, I think we really like tend to believe that everything we use now is uh, sort of an invention of the close past, not the really far, far past. But this was actually not. And of course, I'm not claiming this was the only post service that existed in the world, but certainly it was one of the best organized ones, and I think the earliest we have notice of. What was the usage if you didn't have a royal, like an institution system, you would normally pay private messengers or you would ask somebody to deliver a message to other person if you were an individual. Say some, say you live in a town and a merchant passes by, stays for two days and then you hear that person's gonna go to a city where someone of your family lives, you could ask that person, could you find these other person and deliver this message? That was something that was done. And that was something that we actually do nowadays. Like, hey, if you see this person, tell them X or Y. So we haven't changed much. I would love to go horse riding, but I, you know, like as a messenger in Iran, <laughs> But I am afraid I cannot ride without stirrups and I would just fall the instant I will be <laughs> starting a gallop. I would just fall between the ears of my horse and that will be such a show to contemplate. <laughs> Let's see if I forgot something. Of course, guys, if you have any questions, you feel free to ask them because... No, I think I... Yeah, I think I have a... I think that's everything... Uh from me, yeah. This is this is everything I, I want to say. And um, this is how far the research um, has gone about the Cheporjanes and the Pope system. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them at me. I'm just gonna be sipping my tea here.
which is by the way almost finished and that makes me sad. I really hope, Helena, your pancakes were good. I just cannot stop think of thinking of them. Thank you, Lucas. <laughs> I'm really happy they were, Helena. <laughs> and tea is over. That is always very saddening. But we have water. We'll treat you later, Mabe, as I missed most of it. Right, guys, don't worry. Come into the streams. Uh, it's difficult. I know the schedule sometimes is not great for for all of you, but the streams are say like automatically they're saved on Twitch, and then I upload them to YouTube on my YouTube channel between a day or something with editing and all that jazz. Oh, there's a question. How did they make sure sensitive information secret? with the system or was it on a No, actually, that's actually a good question. I should have mentioned this. The riders had sealed bags. So when they gave you the letter, the message, the package, anything, they will give you a bag that it was sealed. So if you try to steal whatever was inside, if something happened along the way, the bag would need to be broken in order for somebody to access the content. So it will be known it would be known that the messenger didn't do the job properly or that something happened. So the sealed bag, I actually don't know what material was made of because there's not much information about that. But basically it's a kind of, of bag that needs to be, what we know for certain it does is that it would need to be broken, like completely ripped or tear apart, like tore apart for it to open. So that was how you would achieve what we will call here trust because yeah sure you trust your workers but there's some things you cannot trust anybody with so yeah that is that is how they they did it actually there's a very big tradition of uh sealing sealing messages in mesopotamia i am pretty sure it, like a lot of other cultures developed a really similar system i just don't know of them but in mesopotamia you know clay tablets they will put the message inside a ta an, another clay tablet so for opening it and reading what was inside you have to smash the first one like really rip it like break it completely so the yeah the the person who received the letter would know there will be there was always a way of knowing if you'd open the letter or not again i'm pretty sure that all my historian colleagues that are here listening to me would know of all the like all the context all the cultures and all the societies that developed a really like similar system because humanity has a very long history with information they want to protect. So there you have it. <laughs> okay, so I think that is everything from me now. Thank you so much for joining the live stream. It's always a pleasure to see all of you here. I'm really happy the I'm really happy that you st stick with me and to the things that I tell you. I, you know, for the people that just joined, my channel is an uh, affiliate channel now. I met the requirements for affiliate and that means um, you can subscribe to my channel. You can help me a little bit with a little bit of push. If you have an Amazon Prime uh, account, the your account comes with a free Twitch subscription. So just consider for a second subscribing here so you don't have to pay anymore and uh yeah as always thank you so much patrons thank you lucas thank you aina and thank you angel for your support please consider support me and patch supporting me on patron and um on the next live stream i am going to be dealing with uh, something that is quite in the news lately about a very famous lineage of video games hint hint and um, I would do, I will deal with the same thing for Friday, which is in Spanish, but then on Monday, I will talk about the same thing. Like next week is going to be the same uh, topic as uh, Friday, because I think there's a lot of people like English because they will want to, they will want to know about this too. So thanks, thanks to you guys. Um, no, it's going to be for both. It's going to be for uh, Spanish and like, next Friday and next Monday. They're going to be about the same topic. Stay tuned uh, if you want to know a little bit more. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so, so much as always. And I really wish you have a very nice week. And as always, stay safe.
please be careful and take care of each other. I will see you if you want to join me on Friday. I will see you there. And if not, I will wait for you here on Monday. And yeah, I'm going to play Cruel Angel Thesis one more time because I would love to play. I would really like to play um, the Star Wars theme again, but you know, copyright. <laughs> We're not going to do that. And yeah, thank you, Aina. May the 4th and may the 4th be with you. So yeah, I, I really, really enjoy your company in here. And I hopefully I taught you something you didn't know about. So <laughs> thank you so much, guys. And yeah, see you shortly. <laughs>